Yeah, you're right, Frank. The 2SE and E2SE carburetors do look an awful lot alike. And from what I've heard, they're both on the same 1980 engine, too, the 2.5-liter four-cylinder. What are the differences between these carburetors, anyway? Well, there are three areas that you should be familiar with regarding these new carburetors. Model applications, design similarities and differences, and disassembly, reassembly, and adjustment procedures. And just by coincidence, these are the three areas that will be discussed in this training film. As far as model applications go, you were right when you said that both of these new carburetors are used on the new 2.5-liter four-cylinder. As you know, this is the only four-cylinder engine used in 1980 AMC and Jeep vehicles. The 2SE carburetor is used on the four-cylinder AMC and Jeep 49 state models, but the E2SE is used on the models equipped with the California emission package. Okay, I'm getting the picture now. This means that the E2SE is used only on vehicles equipped with a new fuel feedback emission control system. Yep. Now let's look at the design similarities and differences between these two carburetors. Both models are two Venturi two-stage carburetors. They both utilize a downdraft design. Lightweight aluminum castings are used for the air horn, float bowl, and throttle body. Also, a heat insulator gasket is located between the throttle body and float bowl to reduce heat transfer to the float bowl. Here's the important difference between these carburetors. As we've said, Frank, the E2SE is used on California vehicles, which are equipped with a new fuel feedback system. Part of that system is the mixture control solenoid shown here. The 2SE does not utilize a mixture control solenoid. And here are the rest of the components involved in the C4 system. Mm-hmm. In addition to the mixture control solenoid, the system features an oxygen sensor, an electronic control module, or ECM, two vacuum switches, and a coolant temperature sensor. Incidentally, Frank, if you or any of our viewers aren't familiar with the new fuel feedback systems, I strongly recommend that you study the 1980 training release 80-1, which is entitled The Fuel Feedback Systems. The film and reference book included in that training kit provide complete theory of operation and service information on the C4 system and the system used on some of our six-cylinder vehicles. Yeah, I've seen it, and it really got me squared away on fuel feedback. Good. Then let's go right into the six metering circuits of the 2SE and E2SE carburetors. These are the float, choke, idle and low speed, main metering, power enrichment, and accelerator pump circuits. These are basically the same circuits used in all of our carburetors, aren't they? Mm-hmm. These are conventional circuits found in most carburetors throughout the industry. The float circuits in both carburetors are identical. A single pontoon float, a rubber-tipped float needle, and a brass needle seat are the components that control the fuel level in the float chamber. The float chamber is internally vented through a vent cavity in the air horn. A small, removable, meshed screen is located at the top of the vent cavity. The float chamber is externally vented through a vent tube in the air horn. A hose connects this tube directly to a vacuum-operated vapor vent valve. Hey, I see there's an inlet fuel filter here. Yeah, both carburetors utilize this type of filter. If you have occasion to diagnose a drivability problem on one of these carburetors, you might want to check the filter. The choke circuits are almost identical on both carburetors. A single vacuum brake and air valve control diaphragm is mounted on the idle speed solenoid bracket. All of the other choke components are also shown here in white. Pretty conventional. Is the choke coil adjustable on these carburetors? Well. You just hit on the one difference in the choke circuits. The 2SE coil is adjustable, but the E2SE's choke housing cover is tamper-proof. Here's the 2SE's idle circuit. The fuel flows through the idle tube to the idle crossover passage. From there, it flows through the idle channel restriction and out the idle discharge hole. As you can see, air enters through the idle air bleeds and is mixed with the fuel. I see that the idle mixture screw is sealed. Yeah, you'll find important information regarding idle mixture adjustments in the handy bench chart that accompanies this film. 
The bench chart contains all service adjustments for both carburetors, plus complete disassembly and reassembly steps. Before we get into the E2SE idle circuit, let's just take a quick look at the mixture control solenoid functions. The solenoid, in response to an electrical signal from the electronic module, actuates a spring-loaded metering rod. This rod controls the fuel flow to the main metering circuit, the power enrichment circuit, and the idle circuit. One terminal of the mixture control solenoid is connected to 12 volts, while the other is connected to the ECM. The ECM provides a ground path for the mixture control solenoid in response to input received from the other fuel feedback components. Here, the ECM is not switched to ground, so the mixture control solenoid is de-energized. Now the solenoid is in its rich position. The fuel is now flowing through both the main jet and the solenoid jet. When the ECM is grounded, the mixture control solenoid is energized. Now the spring-loaded metering rod is forced down, cutting off fuel flow through the solenoid jet. Fuel now flows through the main jet only. In actual operation, the ECM is continually energizing and de-energizing the mixture control solenoid. Correct again. Incidentally, there's another design feature that you should be aware of. The E2SE features a lean mixture screw that controls fuel flow through the main jet. This screw is factory adjusted and sealed. Due to the use of the mixture control solenoid, the E2SE's idle circuit functions rather uniquely. So far, we've looked at the fuel metering function of the mixture control solenoid. But in the idle circuit, the solenoid meters the air introduced into the mixture. As you can see here, when the solenoid is energized, a large supply of air is introduced through the clean air passage to lean the mixture out. When a richer mixture is needed, the solenoid is de-energized. Now the solenoid plunger blocks the air in the clean air passage. And also the fuel flows through both the main jet and the solenoid jet. Mm -hmm. This helps enrich the mixture even more. The main metering circuits in these carburetors also operate somewhat differently. First, let's check out the 2SE main metering circuit, which is shown here. The chief components are the main metering rod, the main metering jet, a factory-adjusted part-throttle calibration screw, a spring-loaded power piston, the main well, the top main well air bleed, the main discharge nozzle, booster venturi, and the main venturi. I know that the main metering circuit controls fuel flow under part throttle and cruising speeds, but exactly how does that happen in the 2SE? Does this main metering circuit function like those in most other carburetors? Yeah, it's pretty conventional. A number of things are happening at once. Like you said, the main metering circuit controls fuel flow at part throttle and cruising speeds. In these situations, the airflow creates a low pressure area in the Venturi. This low pressure area is magnified by the booster venturi. But look at the float bowl. The air above the fuel level is at normal pressure. So the fuel is pushed from the normal pressure area to the low pressure area. Righto. The fuel flows through the main metering jet and the main well toward the venturi. The blue arrows here represent fresh air, which enters through the main well air bleeds and is mixed with the fuel. The amount of fuel allowed to pass through the main metering jet is determined by the position of the power piston. The amount of vacuum present in the vacuum channel controls the position of the power piston. I guess this is pretty conventional. Mm-hmm. But the E2SE main metering circuit is somewhat different due to the use of the mixture control solenoid instead of a main metering rod and jet. Also, in addition to the lean mixture screw, there's also a rich mixture screw. Looks like everything else is pretty much the same as the 2SE main metering circuit. Yeah, it is. So, like you said, Frank, the mixture control solenoid is the big difference. Here, it just happens to be in its de-energized or rich position. Otherwise, the E2SE main metering circuit utilizes the same principles as the 2SE. At part throttle and cruising speeds, 
the airflow creates a low pressure area in the venturi. This low pressure area is magnified by the booster venturi. The fuel is forced into this low pressure area from the normal pressure area above the fuel in the float bowl. The air enters through the main well air bleeds and mixes with the fuel. So if the solenoid happened to be energized, the only difference would be that the fuel would flow through the main jet only. Yep. Now let's look at the power enrichment circuits. Actually, there is a primary power enrichment circuit and a secondary enrichment circuit in the 2SE. The primary is shown here. What happens is this. When the driver accelerates, the intake manifold vacuum decreases below the power piston. The spring forces the power piston up. As the power piston is forced up, the metering rod is lifted out of the main metering jet. So, additional fuel now enters the main well. What about the secondary power enrichment circuit? When the driver opens the throttle all the way, the secondary power enrichment circuit is activated. The secondary air valve pulls the secondary metering rod out of the metering jet, and additional fuel flows through the secondary metering jet. As we've seen, the mixture control solenoid meters fuel flow in the E2SE carburetor. When the driver accelerates, the fuel feedback system reports this information to the ECM. The ECM then provides a signal to the solenoid, which will keep the solenoid in its de-energized position the majority of the time. The pump circuits are also identical in both carburetors. This is a conventional design which features a top-loading pump. No surprises here. This is the configuration used on most carburetors I've seen. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. I didn't know I was going to be tested on all this. Well, we've seen all of the six circuits in both the 2SE and E2SE carburetors, Frank. Knowing how you and our viewers enjoy a challenge, I thought maybe a little quiz might be in order before we discuss service procedures. Bring them on. Number one. The blank carburetor is used on vehicles equipped with the C4 fuel feedback system. Which answer is correct? A, the 2SE, or B, the E2SE. Number two. The 2SE and E2SE carburetors utilize identical float and pump circuits. Is this statement A, true, or B, false? Number three. Most of the operational differences between the 2SE and E2SE are due to the use of a mixture control solenoid versus a main metering rod and jet. This statement is A, true, or B, false. The answer to question number one is B. The E2SE carburetor is used on vehicles equipped with the C4 fuel feedback system. The answer to question number two is A, true. The 2SE and E2SE carburetors do utilize identical float and pump circuits. The answer to question number three is A, true. Most of the operational differences are due to the use of a mixture control solenoid versus a main metering rod and jet. Well, how'd you do, Frank? Ace them all. Nice work. Frank, let's talk a little bit about disassembly, reassembly, and adjustment procedures. The 2SE and E2SE carburetors require routine adjustment from time to time, just like other carburetors. In fact, most of these adjustments are the same ones that you've been making to our other carburetors for years. All of the 2SE and E2SE adjustment procedures are contained in the bench chart. This chart also covers complete disassembly and reassembly procedures for both carburetors. Copies of this bench chart are included in every 2SE, E2SE dealership training kit along with this film. I don't want to run through all of these service procedures at this point. The bench chart does a much better job than I could ever do. But there are a few important service procedures worth mentioning. It's important that you know how to diagnose a faulty 2SE or E2SE carburetor. As with other carburetors, there are specific symptoms that suggest a problem within a particular circuit. For instance, the float circuit may very well need service if the vehicle exhibits these symptoms. Flooding or low and high speed surge. 
unusual symptoms at idle or at low speeds and cruising speeds, loss of power under sustained full throttle or high speeds, unusual symptoms during acceleration. Suspect the accelerator pump circuit if the engine stalls or hesitates during acceleration. If an engine coughs and the air horn is sooty, the pump circuit may be causing the engine to run too lean. If the pump circuit is causing the engine to run too rich, the engine may lag but not hesitate or cough. Defective main metering circuit may result in a surge in cruising speeds over 40 miles per hour. The vehicle might also lack passing power. A faulty idle circuit may cause these symptoms. The engine stalls when hot. The engine idles rough when hot. The engine surges at low speeds when it's hot. Speaking of the idle circuit, Frank, this is a good time to discuss the idle mixture screw. As we know, this is a factory adjusted screw. As you can see here, a plug is used to seal the adjusting screw. The idle mixture should be adjusted only if it's required after a carburetor overhaul, if the throttle body is replaced, or if a competent testing authority has determined that an incorrect mixture is causing high carbon monoxide emission levels. If you ever have occasion to remove a plug, as shown here, you can be pretty sure that the throttle plate housing will crack. This is normal. And this is the tool needed to adjust the idle mixture. Right. The screw isn't slotted, so this special tool is required. Frank, it's really critical that you remember a few things when you perform this adjustment. Remember to check the emission levels after you've made the adjustment. Always use the adjustment procedure outlined in the technical service manual. Be sure to perform the adjustment with the air cleaner on and the engine at operating temperature. Oh boy, we've all seen the symptoms of a defective choke a million times. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the engine won't even start. Of course, it may idle rough or run poorly at low speeds when it's cold. The engine may stall or cough when it's cold. The engine may idle too fast or slow, or it may fast idle too long. Sometimes it'll stall when it's just getting warmed up. I'd say that a defective choke circuit is the most common carburetor problem you find. Yep. Frank, you should invest in one of these angle measuring gauges. This gauge is required to perform a number of measurements and adjustments on the 2SE and E2SE carburetors. Let's run through a quick adjustment so that you can see how this gauge is used. One of the procedures requiring the gauge is the fast idle cam position adjustment. Place the gauge squarely on the choke valve. The gauge's magnet will hold it in place. Then set the gauge to the zero degrees mark and center the bubble. Then consult the technical service manual for the correct degree reading. Set the gauge to this specification. Then position the linkages according to the instructions in the bench chart. The bubble should return to center. If this is not the case, adjust the linkages as necessary. Hmm, I can see right now that this gauge is a must. Yeah, it really is. Well, that about takes care of it, Frank. Be sure to keep your bench chart in a handy place because it can be a real time saver. And as always, your Jeep and AMC TSMs are your most comprehensive source of information on any component.